both. So right now people are logging in. Welcome everyone. We've got about 44 registered for this morning's webinar. And thanks uh, everyone for joining us on a Monday morning or Monday evening, depending on where you're where you're dialing in from. We've got uh, about 12 different countries uh, registered, signed up as far away as uh, India, Pakistan, we've got Germany, uh, Vietnam, the UK, Brazil, um, and of course the United States. Um, we have quite a few isolaveric families as well as D2, uh, L2, HGA, and um, I've got um, Jana Monaco, one of OAA's board members, uh, joining us um, on the panel as well as Dr. Bockley, of course, is here calling in from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thanks so much, Dr. Buckley, for joining us. And we'll give it a few more minutes and see how many um, people will join us. This is going to be recorded, so you can watch this at a later time, and we'll share it on uh, OAA's YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, and just give it a couple more minutes. Jana's uh, calling in from uh, where are you in North Carolina this morning? Yes, I'm in the Outer Banks. Down She's vacationing. The it is the summertime, so I'm sure a lot of uh, folks are um, enjoying the last few weeks of summer here in the in the United States. How's the weather this week, Jana? Much drier. It's hot. I mean, there's still puddles. We had so much rain last week. Our roads were flooded, um, but it's a good week this week. Good, good. And um, if you want, Jana, why don't you give yourself just a quick little intro, um, who, how you represent um, the Isolaveric community? Um, well, I represent the Isolaveric Acidemia community as a fellow parent. And it was 20 years ago this summer that um, Stephen was three and a half, and that's <coughs> when he went into his metabolic crisis and diagnosed. And Dr. Vockley helped with that diagnosis. <laughs> Little did you know you would get to actually have to be involved with me one day. <laughs> um, and then Caroline came a year later and she too was diagnosed with IVA before she was born. And so because Stephen was one of those casualties not identified through newborn screening, I became an advocate after learning so much about it through OAA and I've taken part with the Secretary's Advisory Committee with Dr. Vockley to, for newborn screening. And I continue to advocate for expanded newborn screening st um, statewide and nationally, and also the rare disease community as a whole. And, and I'm really happy to always represent OAA, taking advantage of being near Washington, DC. Yes, absolutely. She's, she's been our um, main advocate there in DC for many years and we are very blessed to have you and uh, thanks for joining us this morning. And again, I'm gonna go ahead. We have about 23 logged in. Like I said, I had about 44 registered, but I know that sometimes uh, something happens, you know, things happen and people don't always join us. So we're good. We have this recorded and people can watch this later. But um, just to keep Dr. Vockley's schedule um, on, since he's a very busy person, we're gonna go ahead and get started with his presentation. And uh, Jana, if you want to turn your cameras off, your uh, off while he's speaking, he's going to share his screen. Uh, but let me give you just a brief introduction. Dr. Vockley has been the medical advisor for the Organic Acidemia Association for many years. For uh, I, I venture to say over twenty years. And twenty for twenty for twenty years. Um, yeah. Here's my. And we awarded him with this prestigious award recently. It's for lovely. His, Thank you. His uh, distinguished help. Um, on our medical advisor, and thank you so much. And also want to thank uh, one of our isolaveric parents, Richard Bazzi, for, for creating that beautiful award for him. And thanks so much, Richard, for, for doing that and getting that sent to him. And um, we, we appreciate everything you do and everything you've done for research for, for all of our organic acidemias. And uh, just so in case you don't know, Dr. Bockley, uh, is currently at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh as a chief of division 
of the Division of Medical Genetics. He started there in 2004 and was named Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and the Professor of Human Genetics at the University Graduate School of Public Health. And he's a, a board certified in pediatrics, clinical genetics, and, he, and biochemical molecular genetics. He's published more than 70 articles in leading genetic and biochemical journals and numerous honors in his work. And I've uh, met Dr. Bockley way before that when he was at Mayo here in Minnesota. I'm calling in from Minnesota and Dr. Bockley was at Mayo Clinic. How long were you at Mayo, Dr. Bockley? Uh, almost 12 years. Oh, 12 years. So we go back, you know, long time. So, um, so I appreciate you coming on and speaking. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, a lot of things uh, in the research area is kind of concentrated on on MMA and PA. And uh, I know that you are also very involved with isoleveric and D2 L2 HTA. So I appreciate you sharing what you're doing in that area as well. And uh, we will take questions. There's a Q and A box down at the bottom. And if you have questions that um, you'd like to pose to Dr. Buckley after his presentation, we'll, we'll answer those live uh, as they come on. And uh, I know some submitted it beforehand and we'll see how much time that we have at the end and, and what we can share. So with that, we'll go ahead and let you share your screen. Alrighty, thanks. This is always the moment of truth. You know, after almost two years of doing this, you still have to figure <laughs> out uh, if it's really going to work or not. Um, how are we doing? Do we yep. look good? Looks good. Alrighty, and then let me grab a laser pointer so that I can work with that. Okay, so uh, thanks very much, uh, Kathleen and Jennifer, both, both of you for being here. And, and uh, I'm, I'm actually going to go back to my roots because I, I started um, my, my, um, my independent academic career, as it were, of studying isovaleric acidemia. Uh, and and uh, a lot of my work with fatty acid oxidation disorders has sort of taken precedence over the last few years simply because of opportunities. Um, and, and now uh, I think they're starting to present itself to themselves again with some of these other disorders. Um, and some new work that we're doing on DL2 hydroxyglutaric acidemia. Uh, I have to say, um, at one of these uh, family meetings, I feel like it was 10 years ago, I, I had a, a, a DL2 hydroxyglutaric acidemia family come to me and say, so is anybody doing anything on this? Are you doing anything on this disease? And I said, no, I'm not. And I felt really bad about it. So I'm going to make up for it today. So hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about this. Um, uh, th these slides are going to be a little technical. So I'm going to more talk about the concepts of them um, rather than, than go through them in, 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 in detail. All righty, so uh, disclosures, uh, a lot of research funding from including working with a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies these days <coughs> and uh, some consulting. <coughs> well, let's start with the basics. When you, when you think about inborn errors in metabolism, there, there are two problems. Um, that is, a chemical is supposed to be worked, uh, transformed from by, by an enzyme to another chemical. And that's in a pathway where, where chemical reactions are all built up one after the other. Um, and these chemicals need to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and and uh, uh, otherwise the, the, the pathway doesn't work. So if you have a block in there, a genetic disease uh, that, that uh, um, uh, uh, keeps one of those enzyme reactions from working, you have two things that can, that, that, that can occur. One is, <coughs> excuse me, dealing with some allergies here. You have, uh, a, 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 as in a block pipe, you have whatever's supposed to come out of the pipe isn't coming out. But the other problem is that whatever's supposed to be coming out of the pipe and isn't is backing up. And so that can, instead of having water coming out of the pipe, for example, it's coming out into your basement. And, and, um, and, and so um, you can have uh, problems related to both of those phenomenon. And what I'm gonna talk to you today <coughs> is, is um, uh, in, in both of these disorders, um, how that 
buildup of, of, of uh, metabolites, of chemicals causes problems uh, and what we can do to fix that. I'm gonna start off with isovaleric acidemia. This is caused by a block in the chemical pathway that breaks down leucine. This is an amino acid, it's a part of protein. Um, and <clears throat> so it's part of everybody's diet. And, and uh, when the leucine is, is released from the protein, it can go make more protein, but some of it also gets broken down. Um, and one of those steps um, here, um, uh, the, the, a, a, a branched chain ketoacid dehydrogenase, in this case, the isovaleryl-CoA dehydrogenase, um, makes, takes uh, isovaleryl-CoA and makes a chemical called 3-methylcropanil-CoA. And if you have a block, oh, here it is, isovaleryl-CoA dehydrogenase. Sorry, I got it right here. Um, and, and if you have a, if you have a, 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 a block here, um, what happens is not so much a concern with what's not coming through the pathway, but a buildup of uh, isovaleryl-CoA, um, which is toxic. And it can go into lots of other chemicals that are very toxic. Um, and, <clears throat> that's a, and that's where the, 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 the danger in isovaleric acidemia comes in. The current treatments are really to just try to drop the leucine in the diet. So it's low protein um, and therefore low leucine diet or bind up some of these chemicals. In this case, you can bind isovaleryl-CoA to either glycine or carnitine. So it's uh, 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 to try to siphon off some of this, but it doesn't work um, as well as we would like. And you still have to have a specialty diet. Um, as, as Jenna mentioned at the beginning of the, in the introduction, um, this is now identified by newborn screening. And so usually we can get to kids before they get sick. And that's a good thing because if we can identify them um, before they get sick, the outcomes are improved dramatically. <coughs> there are some mild variants that show up through newborn screening. We're not gonna talk about those today. They're not really um, diseases per se. They, kids with those variants have some chemicals that look like isovaleric acidemia, but they don't get sick. And when you're looking at genetic diseases, there are lots of opportunities to make mistakes. There's something in, in, um, <clears throat> in um, uh, uh, biology called the central dogma. Um, and that says, oh my goodness, I just put this in there today and it's wrong. <laughs> I should go out and change this. Uh, you, can, you, you can see, it's DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. I was going backwards for a while and I had to fix it and I only fixed half of it. Um, and, and, uh, and so a mutation in, this should be DNA, affects the RNA, that's the intermediate between DNA and protein and causes a protein abnormality. Now, growing protein strings are two-dimensional. It's like adding a bead on a, on a necklace. Um, <coughs> it's not functional. It has to take on a three-dimensional state shown here. This is isovaleric, uh, isovaleryl coa dehydrogenase um, that, that starts with this one-at-a-time amino acid. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. <coughs> um, and, um, and then it, it uh, uh, goes into a three-dimensional conformation. Therapeutics can target any part of this process, but one of the things um, that, that has uh, evolved uh, over the year out of studying proteins that are, um, are not um, made correctly, as in a mutant protein in a disease, um, is that sometimes they just don't fold properly. And if you can convince them to fold properly, they have a little bit of activity. Um, and there are small molecules, chemicals, drugs, that can bind while these proteins are being made, they can stabilize it. And that's called a chaperonin. So this is what we're gonna be talking about, chaperonins here for isovaleric acidemia. Now, we talked about a chemical pathway and chemical pathways have their physical um, uh, representation in the cell as proteins, enzymes, and they all have to work together. Um, and, and it's not, um, terribly realistic to think that a chemical is going to go find an enzyme and then it's going to kick off another chemical, it's going to go find another enzyme. It doesn't work that way. They tend to be bunched up together in protein complexes and, and, and that makes the whole process more efficient. 
In the case of isovaleric acidemia, there's one of two possibilities, and it doesn't really matter which of these is true. Um, they, they all, um, they both can, can lead to the same phenomenon that we're going to talk about. Um, here, all of the, <coughs> the first uh, uh, two steps uh, in isoleucine, uh, leucine and valine metabolism um, are, occur uh, with the same protein, and then they split off. So maybe it looks like this with the independent proteins having independent uh, functions, um, or it could be like this. Everything is together here, a little less um, uh, um, uh, crowded. You can, you can see what it looks like. And in this case, um, <clears throat> if you want to improve uh, your, the, 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 the um, stability of a mutant isovaleric uh, enzyme, um, maybe if you were able to in, in inhibit some of these downstream enzymes, you could back up the molecules, uh, the chemicals, uh, the chemi from these chemical reactions here. And it turns out that the chemicals that are involved in a chemical reaction for an enzyme are among the most potent of these chaperones, things that can stabilize mutant enzymes. So we're going to talk about inhibiting um, this enzyme, methylcrotonyl coa carboxylase, or um, this enzyme here um, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in these two pathways. Um, and uh, the, 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 um, the, the thiolase and the dehydrogenase steps. And we're going to see whether or not that helps stabilize um, isovaleryl CoA dehydrogenase. We start these studies usually by with using fibroblasts. These are cells that we get by a little skin biopsy from our patients. We grow them in the lab. We can test things on those cells without having to actually do things to, to patients. And for this study, we used cells from three different patients one very severe, two relatively mild, and this one maybe not even with um, uh, disease because of this um, common, um, uh, um, no, I'm sorry, this one has one, one copy of the common mutation, uh, common variant that we identify by newborn screening. This one looks like this might also be uh, a, mild, a mild variant. Um, and if you look at these cell lines, we can identify the problem several ways. We can do something that looks at the isovaleryl coa dehydrogenase protein, and that's shown here. If we take a control cell line, a normal individual, and, and you use a, a, a technique that allows you to develop, to identify um, the uh, protein specifically, you can see here the IVD protein is lighter here than in the control, lighter here in the control, completely missing in this individual. Um, and the downstream enzymes, these two, are maybe a little bit less um, than, than, than here. For, and these are just two unrelated proteins to show that uh, there, there's no change there. Uh, for those of you um, um, uh, uh, who like numbers, you can see those numbers um, here. Uh, the, 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 the enzyme activity is reduced by, um, uh, the protein rather is reduced by half here, by about a, a three quarters here and 0% here of, of uh, normal activity, uh, of normal um, protein level. Now, the interesting thing is that we not only have to worry about whether the protein is present, but whether it's active. Um, and here, if you look at an enzyme activity, um, this takes that same protein that we, we, we used to look at that in that previous study and say how much of it is actually active. What you can see is there's very little here. This is normal. Um, even though this one looks like it has a little bit more, 40% rather than 30% compared to um, the third cell line, the third cell line actually has pretty good activity. So whatever protein is there is, is working pretty well. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and so the, that's a, um, uh, a, a uh, uh, just says that, that this patient probably, this individual probably doesn't have clinically significant disease, but these two, do. We can also look in the same way that the, the chemicals that accumulate in, in, in isovaleric acidemia in the blood, um, we can measure these in the cell lines. Um, and so you can see here that um, the, 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 this, one of the specific metabolites that we look at, isovaleryl carnitine, is for whatever reason very high in, in, in this patient, even though the enzyme activity is, is, is relatively higher. Um, and it's a little bit lower in, 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 in these two. So we look at this a number of different ways because the, the signals are a little bit different with every, uh, with every um, 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 
uh, uh, measurement that you use. You know, this, this C2 carnitine, that's acetyl carnitine, that's what comes out at the very end of the pipe. And so what you can see is in this cell line, <clears throat> even though um, there's, a, there's a backup and there's a lot coming through the pipe, means that this individual is probably okay. These individuals um, have uh, a little bit less, but it's, uh, this, this comes from a lot of different places. So it's probably not a good, a good molecule to measure. Now, um, this is this EGCG is a compound that um, occurs in green tea. Um, and uh, it turns out that it binds to the step right past IVD. Um, uh, that methylcrotonyl coa carboxylase. And, uh, and so we treated uh, our isovaleryl coa dehydrogenase deficient cell lines with this enzyme at a bunch of different concentrations to see what would happen. <clears throat> and if you take a control cell line, you can see there's not really any difference here across all these concentrations. Whereas with um, isovaleryl coa dehydrogenase deficient cell lines, IVA cell lines, um, there is a tendency for the enzyme activity to increase here, increase here. By the time you get to the top concentrations, maybe uh, you're starting to get into a little bit of a problem uh, with too much. <laughs> but um, this, looks, this looks pretty, pretty interesting. Um, this is increasing the activity of the mutant enzyme in these individuals. Um, for those of you who like numbers, this shows you what that looks like by uh, treating um, um, uh, these cell lines. You can see we, we, we um, um, uh, more than almost double the, 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 the enzyme activity from those, uh, from those starting cell lines. <clears throat> the problem with this drug, uh, with this compound, is it's in its, in its pure form um, kind of toxic. So you can't use it as a drug. So uh, we've, we've, uh, we've identified different sources of other drugs or other compounds that bind in other steps beyond the isovaleryl coa dehydrogenase to see if we can get the same effect there. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a drug, it's just got a, a, a number, it doesn't have a name, IC54. Um, and, and, uh, and, when we, and when we treat um, cells from IVA patients, uh, you can see um, a little bit of an increase. It's hard to see there, but if we look at activity, um, it's a little, a little bit easier. So here, um, treating um, one cell line um, with, uh, um, with, with, with it, you see a little bit of an increase um, at, uh, at the, uh, at down at the lower concentrations. Um, here, not so much difference in, in, uh, in, in, in this cell line. And in fact, at higher levels, looks like it's probably not working very well. It might even be a little toxic. Um, however, in that one cell line, um, <clears throat> Uh, that that uh, where where uh, the protein increased here, um, we also see an increase in IVD activity, and we see a decrease in the um, isovaleryl carnitine that's accumulating in the cell lines. Uh, so um, it, in in this case, um, we're 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 now looking at a, at a number of of uh, uh oh this I never got to finish this slide. Boy, I must have been asleep when I finished this. Uh, uh, I think I, I, I got a little rushed at the end and didn't quite get to the get to the end. Um, the the uh, I could type it in front of you, but I'll just say it instead. Um, uh, the the that that um, um, uh, stabilization of mutant IBD protein can increase enzyme activity, decrease metabolite accumulation, um, and and gives us uh, an opportunity uh, to start uh, developing compounds. Uh, that might uh, play in, uh, allow us to, to use them as drugs. And I'm going to go back to this slide to talk about the rest of what I was going to say, um, which is to say we also have other opportunities based on this structure um, to, to think about it. For example, um, if the problem here is stuff building up behind IVD, what if we block the pathway sooner than this? Maybe we could keep these toxic compounds from, from becoming uh, toxic. So we're looking at molecules that interfere up here um, and, and uh, could, could uh, uh, work not only for IVD, um, but also uh, for one of the disorders that uh, 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 the, the two of the other disorders that are very well represented in the in the um, organic acidemia uh, society, propionic acidemia and methylmalonic acidemia. So they're all down here, um, and and um, 
so we have we have uh, um, possibilities uh, by based on on looking at this stru these structures for developing um, new drugs and and uh, we have uh, partnerships now with a couple of pharmaceutical companies uh, that we're that we're testing some of these drugs um, in our cell lines. Uh, we have a mouse model that we're looking at, and hopefully we'll be able to move these forward for uh, treatment for isovaleric in, in, the, in the next, you know, these are not quick experiments in the next sort of three to five years. Now I'm going to shift gears um, to talk about um, the uh, DL2-hydroxyglutaric uh, aciduria. This is caused by a mutation in a protein um, that has nothing to do with that compound. Uh, it, it, it's involved in bringing a molecule, a, a chemical called citrate, into the mitochondria. Citrate is a really key um, molecule in, in, the, in the cell. Um, the cell is divided into compartments. There's the main part of the cell uh, that's covered by a membrane that, that, that defines it as a cell, but then there are, are, are subcellular structures, one of which is called a mitochondria, that make up the cell. And the mitochondria, um, inside the mitochondria, citrate works in something called the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle um, to help generate energy. Outside the mitochondria, um, it's involved in <clears throat> the, um, uh, uh, the, the construction of complex lipids that the cell needs to function properly. And um, uh, individuals with, with uh, mutations in this um, uh, for uh, reasons that I'll show you in a second, uh, accumulate this, this chemical, the uh, DL2-hydroxyglutaric aciduria, um, and, and have a, a, a pretty significant clinical picture of, of uh, developmental delay, oftentimes seizures, um, uh, low muscle tone, um, and, uh, and, and it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a disorder <coughs> that right now has, uh, has no therapy. So a number of years ago now, we, we identified a, a, a new case here um, in Pittsburgh that got me thinking again about how we might treat this disorder. Um, an infant who had a pretty classic picture of low tone, <coughs> uh, difficulty breathing, um, feeding issues. He had progressive developmental delay, seizures, um, and, and is now on a, on a, on a ventilator. Um, and in evaluating him from a clinical uh, standpoint, uh, we, we identify the 2-hydroxyglutaric aciduria, which went on to, when well, we went on to show that it was D, DL combined 2-hydroxyglutaric aciduria. We did the molecular studies, which is the usual, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, <coughs> in, in this case, um, and uh, he had uh, two uh, previously identified, unidentified mutations that when we measured activity in cell lines led to a loss about 50% of the ability of that citrate to get back and forth across uh, the mitochondria. Well, what does that do? Um, well, I mentioned that this molecule is, is necessary to make um, energy in, in, in mitochondria. Um, and so uh, we, we tested um, cells from our patients and um, uh, a, a, um, uh, another patient that, that was brought to our attention at the same time we were doing these studies. Uh, and you don't need to know what these are, just that, that, that higher in this test um, is always better. And you can see that the control cell line here is always higher. This is uh, the cells are making more energy no matter what we do to them. Um, the, this this um, patient demonstrated in red here was a milder patient than ours. <coughs> and then our patient down here um, at the bottom had the worst defects in bioenergetics. And here you can see um, Hall uh, uh, calling out each of these individual treatments um, that, that the control cells were always the best. Um, and, uh, and here is something called the spare capacity, the ability of the cells to respond to, to stress um, was um, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the most affected component of this. Um, there we go. <clears throat> so can we do anything with this? Can we use this to, to, to test uh, treatments of, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, combined DL2-hydroxyglutaric aciduria? 
Um, well, there were um, about the time that we first identified our patient, there was some literature that suggested that maybe you could give these patients citrate and they would get better. Um, because if citrate couldn't get into the mitochondria, maybe there was a deficit um, that you could, you could push it forward and get it in. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so we treated our fibroblasts with citrate. Um, and uh, what you're able to see here is this is that same kind of experiment, but no matter how bad it was to start with, if we treated it with citrate, it got worse. Um, similarly, um, our, our patient went to a different center and got started on some citrate therapy, um, came back to us and immediately had a, a medical uh, decompensation. And we were, we were able to show um, that all of his parameters uh, got in, in, in his urine got worse uh, when he got started on uh, citrate. So we don't think citrate is the answer here. Um, it, it is probably <coughs> contributing backing up to um, in, in, the, in the pipeline as, as we talked about with the isovaleric um, and, causing, and causing problems. So if the citrate, which is the molecule that this protein is working on, isn't the problem, um, what is? Where is the to where's the TL2 hydroxyglutaric acid coming from? And is it causing the damage it, or is it a reflection of the damage? Um, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Um, well, here's what happens. Um, in, 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 um, in the TCA cycle, um, if you, if you um, have a block uh, in, and that doesn't keep citrate, it doesn't allow citrate uh, from, uh, to, to, to get in, uh, what happens is everything behind it, uh, uh, it, it backs up and you, and you get an increase in, because the, the, you, the, you need, the, the cycle goes this way under normal circumstances, you need citrate here. If it can't, the, the, the reaction can't go this way, it backs up this way, and you get the uh, accumulation of a chemical called 2-ketoglutarate. Um, this 2-ketoglutarate is not supposed to be present in high concentrations, and so it builds up. Um, it can build up um, as L2-hydroxyglutaric. If you have a defect in, in one enzyme, it, have, it can build up as 2D2-hydroxyglutaric um, uh, if you have a defect in a different enzyme, and it can build up as, um, um, uh, as, as combined DL2-hydroxyglutaric if you just have a lot of this and, and both enzymes work. And that's what happens in this condition, we think. Um, so if it's the, the DL2-hydroxyglutaric that's damaging, which is one of the, um, um, the, 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 the theories for this disorder, by decreasing the 2-ketoglutarate in the cell, we might be able to decrease the accumulation of this toxic compound. Well, it turns out there's a drug that actually does that, and we use it for a completely different um, disorder, a group of disorders called the urea cycle disorders. This is phenylbutyrate. It's also a, a, in a formulation called Revicti. Um, and what it does is it binds a different amino acid called glutamine. How does that decrease 2-ketoglutarate? Well, Glutamine is made from glutamate, is made from 2-ketoglutarate. And, and uh, each time this happens, 2-ketoglutarate makes glutamate, makes glutamine, it, it may, uses a molecule of ammonia. So it helps excrete ammonia. That's why we use it in those groups of disorders. But you can see in 2 uh, hydroxy combined 2-hydroxyglutaric uh, aciduria, um, this might allow us to suck 2-ketoglutarate out of the cell and maybe decrease the overall uh, accumulation of the toxic compound. Well, does that happen? So we went back to fibroblasts um, and just treated our fibroblasts with some phenylbutyrate. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you can see here uh, that, that um, uh, phenylbutyrate, um, which, which is not, a, which is, which is um, uh, um, cells treated with phenylbutyrate, accumulate this phenylacetylglutamine, the, the combination of the, uh, the, the phenylbutyrate plus the glutamine, um, and it's not at all present in control cell lines, okay? Um, this just uh, quantitates that and shows that, that the 2-ketoglutarate in our, in our patient cell lines are elevated, 
Um, and if we treat it with phenylbutyrate, um, it, it, uh, it is, uh, it, it's decreased. If we look at the 2-hydroxy glutarate, very, very low levels in normal cells. Um, here, um, it's, it's very high in patient cells, and it's decreased by about 20% um, in, uh, with, by just treating these fibroblasts with, with uh, phenylbutyrate. Um, uh, this just shows the same thing. Uh, the here, very little, uh, I mentioned very little ac uh, phenylacetylglutamine in, in, in controls uh, and in patient cells, not treated, but when you treat them, uh, you, get a, you get a ton of this stuff. Does it work? Does it help anything? Well, if we take our, um, the cells from our patient and we treat with phenylbutyrate, what you can see is that untreated, remember this is the cell line that had the worst parameters, um, we treat with phenylbutyrate, it just keeps getting better. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, it looks like uh, treating with phenylbutyrate is improving the bioenergetics of these cell lines. And, and since much of the problem in this disorder does appear to be a problem with bioenergetics, this, this uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a good thing. <clears throat> Remember that I, I, I also talked about um, the, the, the role of, of citrate in um, um, making these, these, these fats that are necessary for normal cellular function. And, and what you can see um, in, in, in this slide um, is, is that um, the cells uh, from, our, from our patients um, have uh, a... a um, uh, a, a, an abnormal amount of many of the fats that we're talking about uh, in in uh, in these uh, 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 that 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 are, are necessary for uh, normal cellular function, and um, some of those are are uh, are also related to energy metabolism. Um, here. Uh, uh, compounds related to uh, fatty acid oxidation, another one of the energy cycles in the in the um, in the in the uh, in the cell, and and it and it turns out uh, that that phenylbutyrate has a a separate effect on on, on cells uh, by uh, increasing the amount of fatty acid oxidation gene exp uh, expression. Here, overall fatty acid oxidation. Um, without treatment, um, and here uh, the, the genes involved in fatty acid oxidation are going up when we treat our cells with, with um, uh, phenylbutyrate. And when we look at our DL2 hydroxyfibroblasts, um, what you can see is that their fatty acid oxidation is decreased um, and, uh, and, and it increases when we treat them with phenylbutyrate. So, don't despair all those years that I sidelined over to fatty acid oxidation. It's helping us now because here it looks like we can improve fatty acid oxidation as well as that other energy metabolism that we talked about, the TCA cycle um, and the respiratory chain. Um, so overall, it looks like uh, these are doing good things for, for cells from, from patients with DL2 hydroxyglutaric um, aciduria. Well, where does that take us? Um, I have to say, I don't think citrate therapy is recommended in, in, in this condition. Um, uh, uh, you could probably titrate a low enough dose where you help overcome some of that uh, deficit in the, in, the, in the rest of the cell, but don't overwhelm the mitochondria, but you really have to uh, um, find, the, find exactly the right dose to make that happen. And I think it's tough. Um, Rather, I think 2 ketoglutarate is, 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 is the problem here, uh, or at least a major part of the problem, and we need to reduce that. Our fibroblast studies show that we can do that with um, phenylbutyrate or Revicti, and this is an FDA-approved drug, um, so it should be easier to bring this to uh, clinical trials. Um, we, we have already treated one patient um, with this uh, uh, drug. It's an open label trial. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's, you know, we're, we'll, 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 be, we'll be following um, this patient's um, um, uh, response to therapy. I've gotten some funding from the company that makes Revicti to treat one of my other patients with this drug. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully we can use our results from these two patients to develop a, a larger a protocol that will allow us to bring this to the, 
to to uh, the rest of you who have uh, uh, children with uh, with this disorder in in a way that allows us to um, see uh, whether whether this is going to make a difference and hopefully then um, the sooner we treat the better off we'll be because once the damage is done I'm afraid that uh, we're 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 not going to be able to um, improve it by uh, by too terribly much. Now is this just for combined or is this D two L two or is it for you the, have just D2 or just L2? Yeah, at the moment, Kathy, I think it's just going to be for DL. Uh, we've got to do the, for the combined, we have to do the same kinds of studies on fibroblasts from those <laughs> in individual disorders to see um, whether um, a two ketoglutarate uh, reduction will decrease the flux through those pathways as well. I think it might, but we haven't done those studies yet. Okay, so because the combined is kind of pretty rare. It is pretty yeah. rare. Um, it is pretty rare. But it, in this case, um, tell you what, let me, let me just get out of here. I'm going to, this is my okay. lab. I'm going to thank them for doing all the work. Sure. Uh, my clinical team, um, a lovely hospital, and I'm going to get out of sharing mode. Um, and uh, and we, can, uh, we, can, we can go back to uh, just having a, a conversation here for the last uh, 15 uh, uh, minutes or, 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 or so. Thank um, Thanks so much. That, you know, I know it's very difficult not to, you know, get real technical when in dealing with, with our disorders because our disorders involve a lot of very technical, technical. <laughs> stuff. Uh, so I'm sure, you know, um, they're, the professionals on the line probably appreciate it where the parents might, might have gone right over their head. But um, yeah, I guess the key question is, you know, that you, you are working on these studies in your lab uh, for both uh, isoleveric and D2, and that, that's a good thing. And that pharma companies are interested in uh, pursuing this into potential clinical trials. That they, 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 they are, you know, I, I think there's, there's, uh, there's a recognition that, that uh, you know, we're a capitalist society, there's money to be made in rare diseases now, and, <laughs> and, so, uh, and so that's, that's, that's driving things. Um, I, you know, obviously, the rarer the disease, the harder it is to, to find um, uh, a, a way to that kind of funding. And, and, and so uh, for, the, for the DL2 hydroxyglutaric acidemia studies, for example, I was able to get some, uh, one of the postdoc uh, uh, who did those studies was able to get funding from another rare disease group, the United Mitochondrial Disease, um, um, uh, 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 not, not the foundation, but the, the, uh, the rare disease, the NAMDAC, the North American Metabolic uh, Mitochondrial Disease Consortium. There it is. I got to get it right. Oh, wow. Um, and okay. the UMDF, uh, the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation supports them. Um, so, we were, so we were able to get um, some, some funding be, to, 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 to look at that uh, 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 and, and, and show proof of concept. And we may be able then to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to work through um, um, the, 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 um, um, let me get out of my, uh, I got a second here. There we go. I'm still trying to close out all the windows so I can see everybody. Um, uh, we're, 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 we're trying to use some alternative paths to get the funding for some of this. In the meantime, you know, I just, I've got a little bit of discretionary money that comes in from bits and pieces and we use that to, to move, to move things forward and try to, try to keep progress, uh, uh, going. Um, well, we know it's a, we all as parents realize the slow process, and especially, you know, seeing the, the movement within MMA and PA that right now we have uh, three uh, clinical trials right now. Exactly. And obviously, you know, you know, those are, you know, our focus now because they are in clinical trials, but can you just share that how potentially these treatments for MMA and PA could benefit uh, other organic acidemias? Yeah, I, I th there, there, are, there, are, there, there are two answers to that. One is direct and one is indirect. The indirect is anything that, that gives us a focus on rare diseases and shows that we can, we can, we can manipulate these systems and, and make and, 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 and treat kids is, is, is good thing. Um, so, you know, if, it, if it's propionic today and it's methylmalonic today, it, it could be IVD tomorrow. Um, and and uh, and and it just raises consciousness out in the in the in the 
the, 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 the biopharma and, and the inborn errors communities that, that, that these things are possible. But, but the direct um, is, is, is actually kind of interesting. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I showed that one thing where all those proteins were hooked up in a complex and I mentioned that you could block it at the top, maybe you could stop it from getting down to the bottom. Um, and it's actually one of the one of the mechanisms of action, for example, for the Hemisphere um, study that that is is um, uh, now under uh, underway for for propionic and methylmonic acidemias, um, and that it doesn't actually block the, the the passage through the study, but it sort of competes with it, and it decreases the amount of propionyl CoA that's getting into the to 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 the uh, to the bottom of the pathway. Well. Uh, we've, we've worked with a number of compounds now that block it right at the very top. And if you can block it at the top, it's going to be good for maple syrup urine disease. It's going to be good for isovaleryl. Uh, it's going to be good for um, uh, PA, for MMA. It's going to be good for all of those other ones in the isoleucine and valine pathway that right now are really uh, true orphans because there's just no therapies for them. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so there, there, there are, are uh, um, direct benefits about thinking of these as, 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 a, as, a, as a group. And, and, uh, and, and so I have to hand it to the families. You guys had it right all along. You know, you talk about organic acidemias and not any one disease because something that, 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 uh, that, that helps uh, one of these uh, has a pretty good chance of, of uh, eventually spinning off and, and, and helping others. Okay, great. Well, we have a couple of questions and if you wanna, uh, I, I guess I can allow people to talk if you prefer to share your question live, raise got, your hand, I've got otherwise. The, the, I've got the Q and A up here. I can, I can yeah. read from there. Um, uh, uh, the first question, uh, can we expect uh, therapies for IVA in the markets in the next few years? Uh, you know, that's always a hard one because uh, first of all, we got we to do the lab studies, then we got to get the companies interested in them, and then we got to do the studies. Um, the, the, I will tell you that the average time for something like that's about 10 years. I'll give you as, as, as an example. When I first started getting involved in, in um, one of the drugs that I, that I ultimately got approved for um, long chain fatty acid oxidation disorders, triheptanoin, now, now approved just last year for long chain fatty acid oxidation disorders, it's about 10 years. Um, wow. Yeah, that's a so um, uh, hang in there. Um, you know, our, our 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 goal as a medical community is to help you keep your 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 your, your children as healthy as we can uh, while these therapies are being developed. And 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 sometimes we hit a home run. Sometimes we get something like phenylbutyrate. It's FDA approved. I can do those studies immediately. I don't have to do anything much to to to, to get going. Um, and and uh, uh, so so the so the so I, I would I would think we're going to have something going for the DL2 hydroxy uh, um, uh, uh, patients, hopefully over the next couple, three years, whereas with the isovaleryl, it could take a little longer. Okay, I'm going to let Karen Bennett, I'm going to allow her to talk. Go right ahead. Uh, and she's got a question for you. Karen, if you just um, unmute yourself. Yeah, I just saw that. It looks like just as long as my camera's not on, because I didn't do my hair or makeup. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you are still you are still anonymous. <laughs> Good. And I don't know how to word it without without saying it just how I wrote it. You mentioned something to the effect of some IVA patients who are mild or are considered mild have chemicals that resemble the IVA disease, but might not necessarily have the disease. I was wondering if you, you said it and then went on to something else. I wanted to know if you could repeat it and or explain it. My daughter's, oh, my daughter's 20. She's always been considered, and I hate using this expression, quote unquote, mild, not decompensated. She's had, she was hospitalized as precautions when she had some illnesses and such. But the tests they've done, she's Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So they've done tests and, you know, they consider her mild. She's only on glycine. Meaning carnitine, she, she was able to come off the carnitine. She watches her diet with the protein, but the it's very interesting to me because Dr. Um, Yudkoff, who just retired, and she used to have Dr. Kaplan, have always said they consider her mild, but are there two different milds? Is she mild with IVA or that? Yeah, and I know you don't know her per se, but... 
was very interesting that you said sometimes they can have chemicals that resemble that. And I wonder how that tests out. Am I, is it two different things I'm talking about or thinking about and or not? Yeah, there, 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 there are at least two different things you're talking about. Um, and, and, and one is that, that the, the, the chemicals don't always reflect uh, the, 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 the clinical picture. It is true that when the chemicals are higher, the risk for having severe diseases is, 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 is higher. But I'm, I'm in the same position. I have, I have patients who um, have what look like classical disease. I, I know because I do the enzyme test on the skin cells. Mm -hmm. um, I can show that they have no enzyme activity. I know what their mutations are. They have no potential to make an active protein, but yet they've always been mild. Why mm -hmm. is that? Well, we know one of your genes is, 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 isn't working properly, but, but you've probably got 30,000 other genes that are playing into, the, into your clinical mm -hmm. picture. Um, and, and how do they make that disease different? Um, so that's one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, we, 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 have to, we have to think more broadly about what, it, what, what causes our clinical picture. It's like saying, well, I, 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 don't, I don't have a gene for um, genetic short stature syndrome, but I'm still only 5'2". I'm not, I'm 5'11". But my wife's five too. Um, why is that? Well, there are all these genes that have that have uh, that, that play into height. Same thing is going to be true for any other disease. The, the 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 second part of that though is is that is that twenty years ago, um, when when all we were doing was identifying disease by the chemicals, and we didn't know what the molecular defects were, we identified mm. the disease. We said. You have it, and we defined your symptoms on the basis, or we defined mild versus versus um, not by um, the the whether you got sick or not. Um, mm, okay. We, we now we now know that if you have that one common variant that we the, 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 that I, that I reported uh, a number of years ago now, back when I was at Mayo, uh, Kathy's already spilled the beans how long ago that was. Um, uh, uh, that 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 if you have that if you have one copy of that variant, you probably don't have disease. You've got. Yeah, that's enough. interesting. You bring that. Sorry to interrupt you. That's interesting. You bring that up because that has been brought up. We we did you know get tested for that. My husband's blood, my blood, you know, her as well. And we do have a re and I am not well versed to speak on that right now. <laughs> I thought it was that nine thirty two number that you showed yep, earlier. That's it. But okay. So yeah, so that's the one that, that did come up on hers. And it's just, I really appreciate you answering my question because very interesting to me how this, you know, we're all, as parents, we're also trying to be so detailed with our kids. Mm -hmm. And now that she's 20, she's entering into a whole bunch of new things. I was worried every day when she was little, but no, she's... Brand new, brand new German study that just followed um, all of their uh, isovaleric kids um, identified by newborn screening over the last 20 years. No yeah. one who had the 932 mutation um, got sick. Interesting. And, and if I could say, I, I might be totally wrong, but I'm pretty sure we're involved in that study. Our blood went out there and, you know, that's just very, so I appreciate your time. I really, thanks. I've always wanted to do you meet need, you and I appreciate it. Do you it. need to cut off at a, at a uh, noon, Dr. Falcon? Can you answer um, a couple more questions? Let me double check questions? here. And, let me double check and see what my, what my schedule is. I don't know what I'm, what Wanna I, be. I, what I got at noon. Um, Considerate of your time, and uh, uh, I, just I can have a I can talk for I can talk for a few extra minutes. I know we okay. got started a little. Um, late. We have um, someone that's asking about, uh, about the uh, phenol phenol pheno, I can't even pronounce it. The drug that you suggested for the D two L D uh, HTA yeah. uh, does it do any harm uh, if if they just had the D two HGA if they were well, to be treated with that. So you never, you never, you can't go into a, a, a study like that you, you, because we don't know. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and so the, the, um, the, So they probably wouldn't prescribe it. I wouldn't prescribe it. No, uh, yeah. what we, what we, what we need to do and, 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 and we will, um, is, is get skin cells from, from patients with the other two, the D and the L, the isolated D and the L. And we'll do the same test that we did with the combined and we'll, we'll, we'll see what that looks like. And, and uh, um, you know, stay tuned, maybe next year. I can, So maybe you'll come yeah. back and ask parents yeah. to submit that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you do, if you do have um, 
um, if, if you're if you're listening and you've got either a D or L, um, and, and and you've had a your your, pay, your your kids have had a skin biopsy for a, a fibroblast culture, you can ask your doctors to contact me, and they can send me those cells, and we can test them. Um, that's the that's the first step in seeing whether or not this is a something that's going to going to work for for the the isolated defects as well. Okay. And then um, also a question about the two patients that are do, uh, undergoing that. Um, only one treat, only one treated so far, um, and and uh, and I think it's just too soon to tell you whether there's any any improvement. Um, okay. You know, there's a heavy placebo effect when you say this might work and you give it, and and you, you don't have any way of controlling for that. Um, so uh, I, I I I can't. I don't think I feel comfortable saying. I know whether that patient is doing well, better or not. It's also not my patient. One of one of uh, 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 with a referring physician is, is is handling taking care of that patient. I'll be starting my patient on it soon, and we'll be doing some 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 more rigorous um, uh, testing. And hopefully, I can tell you uh, uh, about about uh, um, what that looks like again in in, uh, in in four or six months once we're able to do some of those measurements. Okay. And Fiona, I, I'm going to allow you to uh, ask your question uh, live if you feel comfortable doing so and just unmute. Um, First of all, sorry. thank you very much, um, Dr. Vockley. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I, I think it's interesting the, um, you know, where you've got more than one condition. My, my son um, was diagnosed very late as having a mild variant of IVA, but when he had the genetic screening, we found that he was also carrier for HADA, for NAGS, um, and for two other um, uh, conditions within the um, uh, uh, urea cycle. Um, so he's, he's diagnosed as having mitochondrial dysfunction and IVA. Um, and his doctor talks about heterozygous synchronicity, which is what she believes most of his symptoms are from because his symptoms are more severe than what you would expect for somebody who's got a mild version um, of, of IVA. Um, and I'll tell you that, that, that this, this goes back to Mayo again. Um, that, that's, that's, a, that's a, um, uh, a theory that I, I published a bunch of years ago that, that this could happen um, and, and have looked at it intermittently over the course of, of, of the last 25 years. Um, I think it's a real thing. Um, I, I've seen it in lots of different combinations where you have pathways, chemical pathways that touch each other um, and, and, and affecting one a little bit and another one a little bit and another one a little bit. You can think about it as increasingly, uh, um, uh, 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 um, instead of one big block in a pipe, narrowing over a course of time or over the course of the distance of the pipe. And, and uh, um, it, the problem is it's a very, very difficult thing to prove because they're all, every, every patient we see with something like this is essentially a, 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 a one, 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 one patient. Um, you never get the same combination twice. Mm. So it's really hard to know how to, how to prove that except to keep saying it comes up over and over and over and over again. Um, and I, I'd, I'd say, I think I've managed to convince a lot of people, including apparently your, your physician, um, that this is a real thing. Um, yeah. And the most you can do is 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 is, is treat it like that, and uh, and and uh, um, w w eventually the, the tools will become more sophisticated that allow us to better understand these pathway interactions and and let us um, um, maybe start teasing apart some of some of these sorts of of, uh, of uh, phenomena. Yeah, we've come a long way, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Um, I do see, Kathy, a couple questions. Uh, uh, one, well, one question about uh, gene editing, <coughs> and I'll throw um, gene therapy in there. Um, <coughs> the answer is, uh, I, I think we'll see gene therapy before we see gene editing, and I'm not sure what the time frame will be. Uh, you know, there's a gene therapy trial out there now for propionic acidemia. So uh, what benefits one will benefit the other. Um, the question will be if we have other medications that work for the condition, it actually may decrease the impetus for companies to come in and develop gene therapy. 
So that's sort of set, uh, where you're almost a, a, a victim of our success in that, in, that, uh, in that setting. But if the drug works, if you have to take it once a day instead of a, uh, you know, have a one-time injection and fix it, it's probably still, um, uh, it, it's, it's way better than, than having nothing at all. So um, I think it'll be a while before you see gene therapy for, for, uh, for, for, for IVA. Um, and this uh, e EGCG compound that you mentioned, um, uh, this is, it, is there a planned clinical trial for that? Um, Not for that one because of the, the, the potential toxicities that I mentioned. Or a non-toxic non yeah, the one, the one, The one that I mentioned after that, the I, IC54, that's a similar thing. It, it's working in the same way. Um, and, and that one doesn't have the same toxicity. So um, <clears throat> we have to finish up the study. Um, the, we, we're, not, we're not completely done with it yet. Um, and then we'll go back to the company that we got the compound from and say, are you interested in trying to move it forward on a clinical trial? If not, get them to release the rights to us to, to, to do it um, rather than, uh, than, uh, than, than them. I had a okay. quick question for you. It, with the different mutations that exist and the discrepancies with managing IVA now, is that going to pose a problem also for this therapy you're discussing? Like, would that only apply to certain mutations and so forth? It is likely to to to, to be the case, um, and 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 uh, and and so what that does is that brings us. Um, into an era that that uh, you've probably heard a lot of in uh, uh, elsewhere in, in medicine called precision medicine, um, that you don't treat everybody with a pick a, 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 a high cholesterol or hypertension uh, the same way. It, you, you, every, you, you have to be able to look at them and identify what it is about them that's causing their problems and treat that specifically. One drug's gonna work better for somebody, another drug's gonna work for, better for somebody else, um, usually for different reasons than we're talking about here. Um, but but um, uh, at, 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 at this point, um, with, with um, many of the things that we're talking about here, uh, will 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 be working hand in hand molecular diagnosis, metabolic di um, uh, characterization, and functional um, measurements that let us know whether uh, an individual is likely to respond to one medication versus another one. Thank you, because I because we see it now, as mm -hmm. you know, there's still um, formula, no formula, carnitine, glycine, none. Um, over restricting protein being a little less restrictive and it's it's so different across the board and that's what I was I was wondering yeah. and I guess those of us many of us have had all already the mutation analysis done will that be a criteria for that as well I, I think the answer inevitably is going to be yes I, I don't I don't think there's any 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 way around it but and and and, and, the, and a lot of the a lot of the phenomenon that that that, that you're talking about is is is, is also this pre-symptomatic versus post-symptomatic recognition the, the 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 difference that you've seen so dramatically in in, in your kids where where um, if if by by definition of your son you've got a severe version of of, of isovaleric but by definition of your daughter it's you know, you know, you'd say, well, gee, maybe it's mild because she's, 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 she's doing so well. Um, so it's also situational uh, and, and uh, um, uh, so, so they're, they're, the, 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 the studies for rare diseases in general are much more difficult because of questions like this and, 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 and issues related to therapy effect. We talk about natural history of a disease. There's no natural history of a disease. Once you've identified it, you start changing the natural history because you're treating. So it's difficult. No kidding. So one other question, uh, are you able to use embryos for DNL? Uh, probably in your research, I know that um, sometimes even, you know, donated livers for, you know, for MMA and PA that's helped uh, for research. Is that something that could, could help? Um, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by don donated embryos. Um, 
you know, there's there's there is in the United States essentially a ban on 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 any experimentation with products of conception. Um, so if you're asking if you've terminated a pregnancy uh, for an affected individual with any disorder, there's no, no. real way forward of using that, that material and for research in the United States. Um, <clears throat> the, however, we can and do use skin cells, as I mentioned, um, and we can reprogram those skin cells to look like embryo cells and then do studies. So it's a, it's a, it's a fine, it's a fine line uh, that, that we, uh, and, and we, we have, we have um, ways that, that we can, we can move forward without, without going afoul of, of uh, our, our, uh, some of our NIH guidelines and, and federal, and federal, uh, federal laws. And then, um, just to get off of the research topic, someone's asking about the Delta variant uh, for COVID. Uh, what, what's your recommendation for sending children back under 12? <laughs> I know it's a tough, depending on where you live. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say two things unequivocally, and and you can get mad at me if you want, but but you 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 need to get vaccinated, and you need to get your children over 12 vaccinated. Period. But, what about under 12? I know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying, these are the things that you can control. Okay. Right. Um, that's it. Um, uh, and, 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 and to protect your kids, you, 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 you get, you, 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 you vaccinate yourself and you vaccinate the, the people who are going to be around them. That's the thing you can control. The things you can't control, um, you, you, uh, you, you have to you have to look at your situation uh, individually and decide what's best for you. I would say that under the current circumstances, um, any individual with a chronic disease um, who is not vaccinated um, should be wearing a mask when they're out in public. School, grocery shopping, concert, whatever, uh, wear a mask. It's easy. You can protect yourself. You can protect your child. Um, and and um, if if you're if you're if you're um, um, two and three and four year olds are 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 are, are going to a a setting um, where where um, the staff isn't vaccinated uh, the the community um, level of COVID is high um, you might have to think about keeping them home. Um, if you're, if you, if you've got five or six year olds who are perfectly willing to keep that mask on, and certainly uh, uh, eight and ten and twelve year olds who are who are willing to keep that mask on, then I, I think there's there's so much benefit to being in person um, that 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 um, uh, that it's 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 worth considering is uh, the best way that I can say it. Right. And then the one last question I have is: there's something called protein tolerance test for IVA. Is there? How would this affect diet and management? Yeah, you're, you're actually going back a long ways. Um, uh, there, before we could actually diagnose this by, by doing an enzyme test or a molecular test, um, one of the things that, that we used to do, especially if the levels were relatively low, uh, was to um, give a protein load. Uh, or, or leucine load and see how high your, your metabolite levels went, or if you got sick in the worst case scenario. And then that would say, okay, this is that bad joke. Doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this, then don't do that. Well, we would tell you not to do that. We would restrict your protein and we'd say you would have it. We don't really need to do that anymore. Um, and and uh, I, don't, I don't really need to know that um, to, to manage your, 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 your diet. Like we can do that simply by uh, titrating your 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 protein um, over time as a newborn, as a as a as a as an infant, um, uh, as a toddler, um, and trying to allow it to go up um, uh, until we start seeing the metabolites get to a level that we're uncomfortable with. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions I've seen online. Is anyone does anyone else have any last minute questions? Otherwise, we will cut it. Uh, off for the day and let Dr. Buckley get on with his busy schedule and appreciate you spending the time with us. Oh, wait a minute, he's got one more. One I was more. gonna say, Kathy, could I shoot one in as well? I think it is quick, but I'll let you read that one first. Okay. And How many hours before a child goes catabolic? 
Um, depends on the age. Um, the the um, uh, uh, we 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 look at this in in our in our fatty acid oxidation kids all of the time because as you go catabolic, your blow your your blood sugar starts dropping. Um, and and um, infants can only go a few hours. Um, as you as you get to um, uh, a year of age, you can probably go eight hours without starting to, 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 to get significantly catabolic. And that's why um, at, 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 at a year of age, I let my patients sleep eight hours. Um, uh, and, and as you get to um, three or four, you can go 12 hours. Um, uh, teenagers, uh, I know, like to go a lot longer. I don't like to let them go much more than about uh, uh, um, eight to 10 hours. Uh, if if you if you have a if you have a, a mild bug that decreases the the, the, fa the fasting that you, uh, time that you can have so I, I I like to I like to keep things in the in the eight to ten hour range for my older children and and adolescents and, and young adults. Okay. Karen, mm -hmm. you got one last one here. You're still on uh, uh, yes, I had asked um, with for your help, and I just thought I might mention it to Dr. Mockley. I, I've been coming across the fact that it is for some patients, but not others, that steroids are a contraindication for metabolic patients and or just IVA. So I'm not sure if it's just IVA or if it's you know, my, my doctors versus other, other people, but my daughter potentially needs a steroid injection and I'm really having a hard time because. Steroids, steroids, steroids we're talking about prednisone or decadron, the things that are used to stop inflammation. Um, they're used in, in asthma, they're used for an allergic reaction. Um, okay. uh, steroids create catabolism, no question about it. Um, there are very rare reports of individuals who were undiagnosed with a, with a, a, a catabolic disease, a disease that gets worse with catabolism, who got sick with something that needed steroids, got the steroids, and then got the disease, they're, they're, they, they went catabolic. Mm, okay. <clears throat> That's made us all very cautious about using steroids. But for the most part, it's okay, as long as you are watching it carefully. Um, so the, the, if, 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 uh, if you have isovaleric acidemia or propionic acidemia and asthma and you need a dose of steroids to bring your asthma under control, you do it. And is that um, the same type of steroid as an injectable steroid in the back per se for her herniated disc is what she had? It is. It is. It is different, but it's worse than the injectable one. The injectable one's much safer because it doesn't, oh. it doesn't, it doesn't go systemic. Interesting. So Thank those, you. so those injectable ones, uh, very little risk uh, to, to something that's that's local injected. Thank you. Okay. So don't worry about that one. It's it's well the, because it's, it's been on her protocol letter for twenty years, and now it comes up, and then I became highly and got so much help from my friends in the groups. But boy. Yeah. How, how something so small becomes such a thing. That's why you have to define your terms in the beginning. And that's why I started with talking about what steroids were. Um, uh, they're, 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 a com there's a, they're a whole class of drugs and they, they're, and they're, and they're, and they're, and they're, they have different effects and when they're, when they're used uh, differently. Thank you so much. Even like over the counter Benadryl, stuff like that. That's not a steroid. Or... That's okay. No? That's an antihistamine. Okay. okay. Yep, no over-the-counter steroids out there. Okay. Except, oh, okay. except, except the, uh, the, the, the rash drugs, the hydrocortisone uh, creams. Those are okay. You can use those. Well, when you think about injecting into the back per se, you think that is systemic because you think it's going into the system, but you say it's quite opposite. Yeah, yeah, very different. Okay, let's see. Um... Well, I'm going to thank you all once more for this lovely piece of bling, I'll keep it. Uh, you can see I, I have others over here. Um, so it has a prominent, prominent place on my, on my, on my desk. Um, and uh, I look forward to, continue to uh, continuing to work with you all. It might not be 20 more years, we'll see. Well, hopefully uh, we'll <laughs> see you uh, at our conference. Uh, we're planning to be uh, in Bethesda for uh, an OAA conference 
next June, and uh, Dr. Vockley hopefully will be there get those, to get, speak. Get those, get those dates out ASAP because my 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 dance card fills up quick. Yeah, I got to get that on your calendar right away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank all right, you all for participating, everybody here. and thank you, Kathy and Jana, for okay. uh, helping host. Bye bye. Well, thank you very it. much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Jana.